Now on to our final speaker of the evening, ladies and gentlemen. Now for more than three decades, our final speaker of the convention has helped companies on every continent build a culture of uplifting service that delivers outstanding business results year after year after year. Making transformation his mission, he's one of the world's most sought after educators, consultants, business leaders and motivational customer service keynote speakers on the topic of achieving superior service. He is the author of the New York Times bestseller, Uplifting Service, and 14 other books on service, business, and inspiration. He's been featured in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the U.S. and USA Today. In 2018, Global Gurus named him the number one customer service guru in the world. After more than 30 years of uplifting service, tonight he is asking you a bigger question. Are you ready to devote yourself to uplifting humanity? That's a Ladies good and question. gentlemen, Ron Kaufman. Hello, 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 hello. Are you seeing my screen clearly and are you seeing me clearly and hearing me? Absolutely. Yes. Beautiful. Okay. Well, Thank you. Thank you so much to every single person who's presented over the past five days, to everyone who's been here for any one of the sessions, and for all of you who are here for this closing final session tonight. I've been in so many of the different sessions, even listening in the breakouts, showing up before things started, and a couple of themes keep coming through. Number one, authenticity. Be real, tell the truth, let us know what's really going on. We appreciate it. All of us are doing that now. Honesty. The other one is vulnerability. So, um, you know, if it hurts, be honest with it. We are camaraderie with each other. We're community with each other. You could even say we're a family with each other. So then given that the topic that I was asked to close our conference with about generative historical responsibility, I thought I'd, you know, treat it like family and, and go back in a little bit of history and be honest with you. I'm an incredibly fortunate guy. I got introduced to the sport of ultimate frisbee when it first came out and the number one rule of the game is called the spirit of the game there are no referees the people who are on the field are the ones responsible for the quality of play and yes that is me jumping up into the air but no i don't think i caught it now i liked to play but i liked even more to be the organizer is that any surprise so I was the guy at the Rose Bowl with the World Frisbee Championships, not out there being one of the champions. I'm the guy with the microphone and the clipboard who knew the name of every single person on the field, every sport, every dog's name, every spin, every throw, every catch, every move. And my job was to bring it to the audience. Everybody could enjoy it. And then I started to do that around the world. And I had the privilege of actually traveling to other countries and bringing the language of Frisbee and the rules of Frisbee and organizing festivals for Frisbee. And of course, you know, you got to find some way to pay for the airline tickets. So I made a business out of it and called it Disc Covering the World and sold Frisbee by mail order. But that part of the commercial side was really just to enable the fun side. What I loved doing was getting groups of people together, just like we do as professional speakers, and then being able to do things like one, two, three, throw, and put it all up in the air. Now, you know, I grew up in America but it just wasn't you know, big enough, it wasn't diverse enough, it wasn't wild enough. So I got out on the road and started taking Frisbee to the Soviet Union when there was one, to the Great Wall of China, into the schools of these crazy play. You know, we really brought play as a language and we brought the rules of the game. And today, millions of people all over the world play that game. Just like millions and millions of people around the world are seeing professional speaking as a potential opportunity for their future. And we know that's a good thing. And that's why on the 50th anniversary of the sport, they put me in the ultimate Frisbee Hall of Fame as one of the Johnny Appleseeds who took the good word out to the world. Along comes 1990, I'm 34 years old, and Singapore has a problem. The low cost manufacturing is going to China, the low cost back end operations are going to India, Singapore is gonna to have to come up the value chain. So they reach out to Singapore Airlines and they get the credibility and the icon from them for service. And the government pours in a lot of money and they wanna create a national service quality training center. And I got the privilege of being the guy with the microphone and the socks aren't bad either. Now we were really, really fortunate because Singapore Airlines already knew how to be outstanding in service within the airline industry. They were the only company in the country that had that great reputation for service. 
because they were one of the only companies in the country that was competing internationally from day one. So they had to play at a higher scale. Today, given what's going on in the professional speaking industry, all of us have got to play at a higher level than any of us have challenged ourselves to play before. And what better place to be for the past five days than right here at the convention, learning all the secrets and all the tips and having people expose how I do it and being as generous as we are to each other. That's what this place is about. Singapore Airlines was extraordinarily generous. They lent their entire reputation for service to this national service training company, including to a 34 year old guy who actually didn't know much about service, but I knew how to get adults to enjoy learning. Where did I get that from? Frisbee. I got to work with Changi Airport when they were just getting started and creating all the values and doing the training and working with the immigration officers and the customs officers. And, you know, it was fantastic. And Changi Airport, number one airport in the world. Singapore Airlines, one of the top rated airlines in the world. Singapore, the country, one of the top in the world. And boy, did I tell the world that story. That was my passport. And I was traveling and traveling more than 100 flights every year. I'm kind of living the life of the professional speaker in the old world, going from stage to stage, to hotel lobby, to lounge, to air flight. And in that era, it was flip charts. And I want you to look at what I was teaching back then. Like up here in one area, you've got a transaction. Eh, call that a speech. Or you've got a repeating relationship. Okay, that's a steady client. But what does it mean when you actually move into a powerful partnership with somebody else? Then you're creating the future together. So when we talk about generating historic responsibility, we're not just talking about the past, we're talking about from the past creating a new future. And that's why I'm taking the time to anchor my past to show you where our future is going. Now, the level of partnership that I had with this magnificent country allowed me to literally be like an ambassador, an unofficial ambassador, explaining the country to people around the world, answering questions. What's going on with the politics? How do you guys get along with each other with so many different ethnicities and religions and cultural backgrounds? So it was kind of natural at a certain point that I should actually deepen the partnership further and become a citizen of Singapore. And then the career kept deepening. I started writing, thought leadership, intellectual property, publishing, coming out with the first book, the second book, the third book. And what do you do after the book? Anybody here remember DVDs? Like actually taking your video and putting it onto some medium that then you hope wouldn't crack and didn't get a scratch. Well, we don't have to worry about that anymore. And by the way, for that green screen to work back then, you needed 50,000 watts of light beaming on the green screen behind you. Today, you can do it with your kitchen light. I go out there then and take all of that IP, that train the trainer driven business model. Remember that because it's going to blow up in a few moments. And then of course, going out on stage and whenever I could getting with the audience, because look, it may be books now, it was Frisbee before, but the spirit is the same. Same spirit, same guy moving from history into the future. And then you guys did something funny. I mean, you gave me a Hall of Fame award and said, oh, lifetime achievement. Like, I fucking do. I'm not going <laughs> off into the distance. I'm right here. So what happens next? Well, before I tell you what's happening next, I need to tell you something about how I am, who I am, where I am right now. If you see me being successful, it's not just because of me. I've got the most extraordinary, incredible, amazing woman by my side. Many of you have met her. It's my wife. Her name is Jen. We're a mom and pop shop. We're running this thing together. In fact, she's sitting right over there running one of the backup computers right now. But when I look at Asia professional speakers and I think about what we've become since this association was founded less than two decades ago with hundreds of members and hundreds of people coming to the convention every year, the thing I'm most proud of is not an award, it's us, it's you, it's this community and the commitment and the passion and the authentic willingness that we have to help each other. And many of you know that I've reached out to you saying, can you explain to me how you do that? Or why do you do it this way or that way? And I know many of you have reached out to me and you're welcome to keep reaching out to me. So there I am doing more than a hundred flights every year. And I looked over at Jen and I said, honey, we need a break. I mean, I need a break. Let's take a real vacation. My wife and I don't take a lot of real vacations. We'd sneak a couple days here, take a little scuba diving time over there, but we decided to do the real thing. 
we booked for the two week luxury cruise through the Magellan Straits from Argentina up the coast of Chile, pulling in at Valparaiso. Mwah! We were going to go out and experience things like we'd never seen before. And certainly we're going to get in Singapore and you're not going to find it in an airport lounge. And you know what? We were not suffering and struggling because that ship behind Jen is a French ship and it only carried 200 passengers. And we had the freaking owner's suite and it was incredible. The wine was fantastic. The captain became our personal friend and then the shit hit the fan. Because we were on that ship as it was going up the coast of Chile when the coronavirus started spreading around the world. And the last place you wanted to be was on a cruise ship. And so as we're going up to try to get off this ship, they closed the border. We had to turn around and go back through the Magellan Straits, come up the other side. Argentina closed the border. Then Uruguay closed the border. And finally, Brazil let us get off the ship. And this was the last picture as we left a three-week quarantine on board a ship. Now, fortunately, nobody got sick. But here were Jen and I, and we're stepping off of what at least felt safe, even though it was kind of chaotic because the whole world was falling apart. And that picture was taken of my wife, Jen, the first time she stepped off the ship and into the car to go to the airport to fly back to Singapore. And if you think she looked a little bit freaked out, that's what I looked like. And you know, <laughs> let me be candid, authentic, vulnerable, honest with you. We had a team that wasn't as big as Adam Coos, but we had to knock it down by two thirds. We had airline clients, we had retail clients, we had hotel clients using our train the trainer model, which requires in-person delivery. Now, fortunately, we also have technology clients and banking clients. So the whole business wasn't gonna disappear, but talk about having to do that from a boat. And then we land in Singapore and we're immediately put in jail? Well, no, it was quarantine. And that was an era when Singapore was quarantining anybody who came in from overseas into a hotel room for two weeks. And it was luck of the draw. Some people were at the Rasa Sentosa Shangri-La, some were at Marina Bay Sands, and Jen and Ron were in the Holiday Inn Express at, Park, at Clark Key. And this room, like if you want to know where Jen is, she's that little orange thing right up there in the corner, like literally a prisoner looking out. And it was only because an APS member came to the hotel, stood in the parking lot and started waving to us. You should have seen Jen jumping up and down, a person, a person, somebody outside. We couldn't even open the window. There were six steps of space inside this room. And the two of us were there together for two full weeks. And thank you to the members of APS who knew we were there, who sent us red wine, you sent us beer, you sent us home cooked food. Thank you, Mwah. oh, community, family. After a few days, it gets a little old and we started looking, you know, sort of a little bit ragged and raggled, but then realized something. We were literally in a cocoon. We'd gone from a three week quarantine on the boat to a quick couple of flights and now we're in another even smaller two-week quarantine and this whole idea about the caterpillar and the cocoon becoming a butterfly it felt really real so i decided to do some research like what actually happens to the caterpillar when it's inside and comes out as a butterfly and you may not know this but i want you to learn about it it releases a protein that literally dissolves the entire caterpillar into a soup it's just like this rich, gooey soup. And out of that soup, there are a few key ingredients that then become an eye or become an antenna or become a wing or become a leg. And the next thing you get this metamorphosis. Now, there's an article that you can read about this. And Jen is going to put this link in the chat right now. So after the convention tonight, grab that link while we're still here and pop it open and read it later on. And you're going to find the article in Scientific American that explains what the heck happens to a caterpillar. Because for a lot of us, it's happening to us right now. Our past is melting down. The history that we've been is like, but the future is calling and is possible. So I said, okay, our train the trainer business model, that's not gonna work anymore. In-person deliveries, that's not happening very much anymore. We were online, but not that much. Oh my goodness, I gotta go way back in history. So I went digging through my papers and you know what I found? My kindergarten report card. My kinder, Mrs. Fuller in kindergarten. And I looked at the comments. I showed them to Jen. She started laughing. <laughs> I thoroughly enjoy them because I never know what to expect. Well, I don't know what to expect either, but I know 
that the spirit of the game is something that is one of those core elements. It's been there in me from the beginning. It'll be there until the day I die. Getting other people involved. It's not about me. It's about what I can do to introduce something enjoyable and uplifting to somebody else. And I've always known that there's something else going on, like that beautiful session that we just finished together, that there's something going on inside that you can carry through into your outside. And I've known that from the past and I'll carry that into the future too. But there are some things from the past that I will not carry into the future because they just kind of go away as much as you might want to keep them. That's life. And so our business did really well. You know, we got to the point where we were published in Harvard Business Review and we had eBooks that were going out around the world. And this was our website. And it said, you know, unbelievable, unleashing the power of your team and your team can do it because rah! And yes, you're right. I was named Global Guru in 2018, 19, 20. In 2020, this year, our program was named the number one program for customer service development. But I always knew in my heart that something wasn't quite right that actually the cocoon of 2020 and this meltdown of the caterpillar is welcome. Because what we've been teaching for several years, a lot of years, is that you use unbelievable service to make you happier customers so that you make more money so you can achieve a sustainable competitive advantage. And that word competitive never sat well with me, but I let it be. I didn't stop it. It kept on going. And if it weren't for COVID, I wouldn't have this moment of tremendous inflection. Underneath at the core of service is not making more money. It's not being more competitive. At the core of service is care. We serve because we care about something. Now, look, these are two different abstractions. And one of them, the service side, I mean, I cracked that one. I spent 30 years of my career working on that one and wrote the definition that service is taking action to create value. And value is when you contribute to the well-being of someone. That's the person who's saying, yes, that's valuable to me. And what you did was good service because your action created value that contributed to my well-being. Now, the well-being can be emotional. Ah, you made me feel good. It could be statistical, operational, financial. Thank you. I got the results I needed. It could be relational. Like, yes, you made me feel more connected. Or it could actually be about the future itself where what I value is the idea that, ah, again, like so many of the sessions in this convention have helped us see the future as a place of huge possibility, not just pain and problems. So we've got this connection now. Service is taking action to create value that contributes to the well-being of something that somebody cares about. What is care? Well, that abstraction I've been studying for the past 15 years, and I'm going to start teaching about it. And if I've spent 30 years teaching about service, well, I got another 30 years, I'll be teaching about care as well. Care is concern. It's attention with intention. You're not just mindful, you're paying attention because you want to help something happen. And it's intention and concern about future well-being. So if you care about your kids, you don't just care about them in this moment. Because as our previous speaker said, this moment becomes the next moment, becomes the next moment, becomes the next moment. Care is concern for future well-being. Service is action that contributes to that well-being. What is the connection between service and care? Service is care in action. Service is care in action. And all those years of building intellectual property around services produced in architecture and models and principles and IP and courses. And you know what? The next 30 years will bring a whole nother one. But I want you to see what it is that I've done with language. Because as speakers, we have the power to do things with language that can help reframe and reshape the way people see themselves and the world and the future. For example, if you go back in history, the word serve comes from Latin meaning slave, like subservient, like the customer is the king. Yeah, well, what are you as the service provider? And what have we said? Ah, you as the service provider are the creator of value. Well, that's the most esteemed and valuable position of all. And that's why the book was called Uplifting Service. Uplift the service the customer gets, uplift your own pride in being a service provider, uplift the dignity of service to one another throughout the entire world. And we've also now reframed the meaning of care. If you go back to the old Norwegian and Germanic, you'll find that care is to grieve. 
Because back in those days, if you were old or you were wounded or you were sick, you were going to die, baby. And so it was just a worry. That's what care meant. That's not what it means today. We're saying care is to encourage and to enable the future. What else are professional speakers hired for? Now, we'd all like the world to be smooth sailing. Right? Even when the waves come, we don't mind waves as long as they're perfectly shaped. I mean, even if they're big, oh, let me show you how I can perform. But what happens when there's a storm, man? What happens when like it's a perfect storm? Like we're facing right now, geopolitical storm, financial storm, medical, biological storm. And there's a lot of people who aren't sure what's going to happen to them. There's a lot more anxiety in the world than we've seen before. A lot more need, a lot more hope, a lot more fear. People are afraid they're going to end up like this. Just, I didn't make it or my department didn't make it, or my small business or my family didn't make it, or I'm responsible for the whole big ship and we may not make it. So what does the world need to avoid this kind of thing? We need good guidance. We need like a lighthouse of clarity that can see through this and then be able to bring people fundamental principles, ways of thinking about who they are, the world in which they live, the lives they live, the communities that we live in, the identities they have, the actions that they take. Who better to do this than people who are professional speakers? And guys, gals, the world needs this real bad right now. Because the world we all inherited with this gorgeous nature, well, look what we've done doing to it. And why? Oh, so we can raise animals to kill them and eat them? By the way, that shortens your lifespan. Or how about this one? We can grow so much food that some people are gonna get really fat because they won't know how to manage themselves with it. Oh, but we don't distribute it evenly around the planet, so some people are actually gonna go hungry. Or we're going to generate so much capitalism and consumerism that like 90% of fashion clothing gets thrown out, certainly before it's worn out. And yet in those dumps, some people are going to find their livelihoods. What kind of a planet is this? What kind of responsibility do you and I have with the rest of our little lives to do something that contributes to the future, maybe even of those who haven't come yet? We've got medical breakthroughs that are happening all over the place. Biotechnology, nanotechnology, fantastic. But we've also got things going on in the world that are really deeply causing suffering and frustration. And yes, suicide rates go up when people feel that way. And we can be the kind of people that speak or listen. Thank you, Cohen, professional listener. So that people feel like, you know, I'll stick around. Yeah, because then you'll get through it. And then it turns and then it changes and then life carries on. We've got better diversity, more and more variety going on in the world than ever before with all the travel and all the people moving around. But that doesn't mean we're seeing equality. That doesn't mean that we, can't, we have to, don't have to stop fighting. And where do we learn the lessons for this? Oh, I know. Let's go ask the teacher. <clears throat> well, that's what education used to be, right? And you know what? He, well, of course it was a he. Of course it was a white he. Of course it was an older white he. Wait, I'm one of those. And, and, and he was considered to be the educator, yeah? And he did it in a classroom. And, and then, you know, he got a little more hip and wore more fun clothing. And we stuck computers in there and all that. But I mean, that kind of education, it didn't interrupt the anxiety people are feeling. That kind of education is not stopping the depression that people are feeling. And it's certainly not ending the isolation that people are feeling, especially in a COVID era like we're all in right now. So to put it in the immortal words of Tom Hanks, Houston, we got a problem. We got to figure out how to make this fit into the hole made for this using nothing but this, which means what? We got to figure out how to make humanity fit into a world where there's billions of us and lots of religions and languages and cultures and nationalities and traditions and prejudices and biases. And, and we got to figure out how to make it fit and evolve successfully using nothing but what we already got. Well, thank goodness one of the things that we got is each other. We, anybody listening to this, we have a community of others who care about each other and are here to encourage each other because we believe in each other and we can take responsibility. We're not gonna be victims in this. We're gonna be the ones that take everything we've learned in the past five days and lean forward in our careers and with our clients and communities and with our colleagues and we're gonna take responsibility. Now, there's three levels of this. The first one is take personal responsibility. I met my wife scuba diving. It's still our favorite avocation. Hope we get to go back and do it one day. But within the hobby, 
we have a mini hobby. And the mini hobby is finding and picking up trash on the reef. Because if there's trash on the reef and a turtle gets caught in it, the turtle might die. It's not something healthy that the fish should be eating anyway. And sometimes you find some pretty wild stuff down there and nothing is more joyful than finding cool trash and pulling it up. But you know, not just down. We've got a daughter, her name is Brighton. And when she was really little, we'd stick her in a backpack and go out there and we'd call it kitty cat hunting because we were looking for kitty cats and she could see them. And when she got a little bit older, she was too big to go into the backpack, but she was big enough to walk with me in the park. And one day we're out in East Coast Park right here in Singapore. We're walking along and I saw a soda bottle lying on the grass just off the path. And I looked at it and I looked at it and I said, hold on, honey. I went over, it wasn't covered with ants. It just looked like it had been dropped there fairly recently. I picked it up, I carried it along with us to the next garbage can and I threw it out. And my daughter said, daddy, why did you do that? That wasn't yours. And I looked at her and I said, honey, you're right. That wasn't mine, I didn't throw it there. But the moment I saw it, it became mine to decide whether to leave it there for the next daddy and daughter to have to see or whether I would be the one to pick it up. And since it wasn't dirty and covered with ants and the garbage can was over there, I went ahead and took it there. I took the responsibility. And you know what? I still do. This morning I took this picture. Yeah, that's me with the Singapore mask. That red thing on my shoulder is because I'm wearing a 20 pound weight vest, walking my 10 kilometers every day, but it's the stick that I'm proud of. That's my trash picking stick. And you know what? I know a lot of you have had mentor walks with me. And if you come for a mentor walk with me again, and we can do it properly physically distanced, I got a stick for you too. So let's go out and clean up the park together. And I'm really happy to let you know that our daughter has turned into this incredible human being who wants to use her intelligence to what? Help make the world a better place. She's passionate about social justice, about education for people who can't afford to get into a traditional educational system. Mwah, bless her. Take personal responsibility. What's that got to do with speakers? How many of you saw Adam Koo yesterday when he just blew us all out of the water? I mean, Adam's been a friend for years, but that guy rocks. And he made one tiny little linguistic error during his talk. And I mean, after a guy does a talk like that, you don't want to go up to him and go, hey, you know, there's one. So I waited, I waited, waited. And then I gave him a call. I said, Adam, man, thank you so much. I really appreciate that you accepted our invitation. And you were just so magnificent for all of us. Hey, do you mind if I just give you one little thing? And he goes, well, yeah, sure. Because he's Adam, right? He always wants to improve continuously. And I said, when you cited Steve Jobs, I just need to let you know it wasn't at Harvard that he gave the talk. It was at Stanford. He said, oh, thank you. I took responsibility to tell him. Now, what about you taking responsibility? Ever heard a speaker say, I got a killer speech, man. We're going to crush the competition. Just watch me hit the target. I'm going to show you all my bullet points. You ever think about what that says? What that feels like? What it really means? How about saying, we're going to stand out. We're going to hit some high goals. We're going to reach the top together. Let me show you my key points for how we function as a team. So all of us can come out as winners. You know why? Because we are in this together. Hello, speakers. Take personal responsibility and create shared responsibility. Look at this. You can plant one tree or maybe teach a kid, but who organizes a group of people to do that? Who gathers together the clan? Who says, let's be the ones that plant the future? Who's the one that creates this so that future generations can enjoy it? Because boy, oh boy, do we need it. What about in the speaker industry? You know, there are things going on in the world that should stop and we know it. And so some people reach out and say, let's take this. Let's be shared in our responsibility. Stop what's wrong. And you know what else? Start what's right, promote it, push it, encourage it. And so kudos to the people in this group who came together and said, yeah, let's not just be against racism, let's promote pluralism. And that's what APS is all about. I mean, look what it says on our website, professionals giving back, become part of the inner circle, a warm and friendly community, learn from the best. You are and can be the best. And so if you're in APS, I invite you to become even more involved in our association. And finally, generate historic responsibility. Yeah, it is about the future. Now look, every single one of us got here the same way. Yeah? Jumped into a body, came out. It was not necessarily a pleasant experience, but it got you the body you got and got you into the life that you have. And oh, damn, there's another tragic side to this, which is it ends. So you're here alive now between that and that. And the question is, what are you going to do with it? Well, let me show you what I'm going to do. 
So I'm invited to teach at Harvard Business School to the alumni of the business school itself. So every single person in this room is a graduate of Harvard Business School. And there I am, man, I'm teaching at Harvard. I mean, come on, this is just like, you know, career dream, right? And everybody's up there looking at the slides. But if you look real closely, there's one cat, one guy right there. He's not looking at the slides. He's looking at me. In fact, he's studying the heck out of me because his name is Dr. Fernando Flores and he's my Obi-Wan Kenobi. This guy is the father of ontological coaching. He was the finance minister of Chile when he was 27 years old. He's got a long and storied career after that. He's 79. I'm still in touch with him regularly. And he's my sensei. And he came to have lunch with me the next day. And he sits down, he goes, Rum. he's got this very deep Chilean accent. He leans across the table and looks at me, goes like this, Rum, what are you going to do with the rest of your life? Oh my God. I mean, here is a guy whose life has gone through one after another, after another, enormous transitions, consequential contributions. And he's asking me, what am I gonna do? And I realize, you know what? Yay, you're the guru, but that's not enough. What are you gonna do with the rest of your life? So I'm gonna spend the rest of my life taking service and using it as a way to bring people to the phenomenon of care and helping them see that actually what underlies care is love. And oh yes, we'll do it online as well. And oh yes, I will still wear a red tie. In fact, I'm gonna double down on it. And if you look in the pocket of my jacket, I'm gonna start wearing a nice red pocket square as well. And backing me up the whole time, is the amazing woman whose name is Jen, who's coming right over from right over here so that she can enjoy being here for the close of this convention and this talk with all of you. There you go. And we've got a question for you. My wife and I would like to know, ready? Friends, what are you gonna do with the rest of your life? We got a suggestion. Generate historic responsibility. If there's anybody in this world who's got the potential to actually make that happen, it's you, it's us, it's all of us doing this together. Now I'm gonna stop share because I wanna do one thing and you're gonna be the first people on the planet to see it. And that is that we are not gonna be shy about this. And so you're now looking at the new corporate branding for our team. Serve, care, love. Thanks for the privilege of serving you. As you can tell, we care about you. We love you. Thank you very much, everybody. Unmute, give your applause to the fabulous Ron Kaufman. Bravo, Ron. Awesome. Love you guys. That was the brilliantest yet. It is a truly fantastic session, ladies and gentlemen, and a brilliant way to round off the convention. Now, there is one.